Welcome on the sixth training of the IOC project, uh, which is an online webinar. And the uh, name is Long-Term Data Storage in IOC and Object Storage in HPC Applications. And uh, today's speaker will be Philippe Daniel from CA. Let me give you an introduction. So Philippe Daniel is a technical, technical coordinator of the IOC project, and uh, he's a research engineer uh, at CA uh, since uh, 1998. Mm, he is now heading the storage systems lab, uh, which is in charge of uh, two large uh, uh, data centers, uh, both CA and DIF. And uh, he uh, is also an active uh, developer of the Luster uh, file system and the original developer of the NFS uh, Ganesha and an open source NFS server in user space. Now let me give you a quick introduction in the IOC project. So the IOC project is part of the C project, uh, which uh, are all funded by the EuroHPC joint undertaking, and all are addressing different aspects of the model of supercomputing architectures. So the IOC uh, uh, project is here in the middle, and it is uh, focusing on improving the IO and uh, developing a hierarchical storage management uh, system uh, in the model uh, architecture. Then we have a deep sea uh, project, uh, which is uh, focused on uh, programming models, compilers, and so on. And we have also the Red Sea project, which is focused on uh, networking and interconnect. And all of those projects are part of the European exascale effort uh, in uh, HPC. Uh, so, now, uh, the partners of the IOC project are coming from many different countries. Um, I think that uh, uh, France has uh, uh, two um, members, the CA and ATAS, um, recently renamed to Eviden. Uh, and uh, we also have a CA. Uh, then we have partners from Czech Republic, SATEC, and IT4I, uh, which is us, which is hosting the, this, uh, this training. And we have ECMWF, uh, Jurich from Germany, uh, EGU, KTH from Sweden, uh, Partec company from Germany, and also Seagate from the United Kingdom. And uh, I think that uh, Philip will give you more uh, in-depth uh, introduction into the project focus, but uh, just let me give you a very quick overview. So the focus of the project is to develop a platform uh, which will leverage the, all the benefits of the object stores. and. Uh, it will be able to seamlessly move the data from all the different tiers of storage uh, which, are out, uh, which are out there. So starting at the bottom are the tape drives um, handled by the Phobos object store uh, software and moving uh, towards the top uh, to, uh, through the mechanical HDDs, SSDs, and NVRAM and VME devices uh, all the way to the top. And you can also uh, see that uh, the IOC project is trying to be somehow holistic in terms of approach to the uh, to the data handling because we are uh, also considering the let's say data temperature, uh, which is starting here at the let's say frozen temperature, which means that the data are supposed to be archived for a long uh, long uh, time, let's say, and all the way to the top on uh, the burning temperature, which means that those are the hottest data which have to be stored on the fastest uh, possible tier of the available storage. And uh, this will be uh, all uh, from me, and uh, I will pass the stage uh, to uh, Philip. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. So thank you everyone to, for attending this, uh, this uh, training. So uh, I'm gonna talk about the IOC software stack and the related concepts which, which are associated to it. Uh, before we start, I would like to address a great thanks to all the contributors to this presentation, which are, so I, I listed the, um, the work package leaders and uh, I had no room to expose all the other people involved in the um, in those work packages who were uh, contributing to the effort of uh, making this presentation. This is basically a, a large compilation of other uh, slide decks that uh, that were exposed during the life of the C project. And um, I, of course, I am not the, the author of all of them. All right, so what you'll be finding in this presentation. So 
uh, basically how, how we present a, a big picture about the mass uh, storage system in the exascale perspective. Um, basically, we, exascale is a reality right now. If you look at machines such as the Frontier supercomputer, uh, it has, we, we have system where we are capable, technologically capable of uh, designing system whose uh, compute power is bigger than an exaflop. And uh, this raises uh, new problems for the uh, new challenges for, for the uh, mass storage system. And from my point of view, uh, there is a very, very, very a big uh, gap to, to deal with, which is probably as big as what we had to design at the very beginning of the SMP architecture in the, in the late 90s and early 2000 years. Uh, those solving those new challenges is basically the motivations behind the IOC project, and I will be exposing the chosen set solutions. So I'll be fo for focusing on different software, so for both on the HSM, HSM feature on the object store, of course, the workflow management and the ephemeral services, the DAISY API, which is an outcome from the IOC project, the ephemeral services, and uh, of course, when you build up a new system, uh, it's nice to know what's happening in it. And uh, it's important to monitor it. And we'll see how monitoring feature itself can bring a brand new interesting feature which could help in uh, automatic optimization of the old system. All right, so let's uh, start with the challenges. From my point of view, we have we are facing five major challenges in the uh, in the mass storage system. The first one is basically a matter about volume, volume of data and volume of metadata. Uh, I I think that we'll have to deal with um, compute centers that will under about one to ten exabytes, which is which seems to be a little, will it call, it's, it's, it's easy to, 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 to speak about a large number such as 10 exabyte. But uh, if, you, if you think back to internet in the years uh, 2009, then the storage size of every devices connected to the internet, uh, supercomputers, in, uh, industry computers, personal computers, phones, on whatever you had connected to the internet, all the storage together um, was uh, had a size of about 10 exabytes. So what we'll have in machine room was the exascale era is the equivalent of the whole internet at the end of the 2009 year. If we consider it for a uh, um, metadata point of view, then we'll have to handle about hundreds of thousands of billions of inodes, about two to the 12. Uh, 2 to the 11, 2 to the 12 uh, inode, which is quite a, a large uh, metadata database. Uh, another point is uh, the size of the system itself is increasing. Uh, if you want to have more compute power, you need to have more cores hosted by more nodes, which means that the client exasket system may contain up to 10,000 to 100,000 nodes or clients. And uh, this will down by introducing some uh, new network topologies, which are directly connected to the fifth challenge, uh, to the fourth challenge about the known, known localities that I will speak later, that I will speak later about it. Uh, dealing with such a large system with 1,000 nodes and 100 of 1,000 uh, client is quite a big challenge for if, if you if you try to maintain the consistency in between such a large number of clients and you have serious serious, serious issues and uh, this number of clients will itself result in a very very heavy pressure on the server system on the storage server system third challenge is about the invasion of the memory per core ratio Actually, if you look from a very, very basic perspective, if you look at the size of the memory, it's increased not as fast as the number of core per node. If you look at compute, uh, compute uh, software, 
they will require a well-defined amount of memory per core, per compute core. For example, you need two gigabytes per computer or 10 gigabytes per compute core. This is the size, the size of memory the simulation card needs to run properly. If you increase the number of core, the, the more number of core you have, the more memory you consume. And which means that on the compute node itself, the more memory you use for computing, the less memory you, you, you have left for running uh, the system itself. And so the available memory from the system software will reduce and it will become difficult to implement uh, some mechanism. For example, the distributed lock management in Luster will become quite tricky to implement. Uh, this problem appeared at the time of the MIC architecture. You, you may remember the night corner and the night landing CPUs. This kind of technology, the MIC technology, is not was not a success, but this problem is still there because of the GPU. And the GPU introduced even more core on the client node, and they uh, make this problem even more crucial. Uh, challenge four, four is about non-locality. So I told you when talking about challenge two that we had to deal with uh, many, 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 many clients. This introduced very complex network topologies and the, the distance from a topological point of view in between the service, the client node and the server nodes will not be homogeneous and it may take a, a, a longer time to go from A to B than to go from A to C. Uh, and this distance uh, has a direct impact on performances. And uh, many, many software do not like to have this kind of heterogeneity in their underlying resources. Uh, challenge five is about data heterogeneity and more generally uh, res storage resource heterogeneity. We are using uh, different storage media. We are using SSD, we're using HDD and tapes, and actually we're using different kind of each of them. For example, when using at CA, we were using HDD, who were uh, uh, who had enclosed Alien because Alien had has very different um, hydrodynamical properties compared to the air, and it could make it possible to have different performances because there's this square enclosing Alien. Um, we are faced be, uh, below this data, this um, storage media heterogeneity. We had to face with many, many different use cases. A high, a, a high is very different from high energy physics, which is on a, which is quite different from other computation. For example, if you look at the HBP project, they are introducing uh, a kind of computation where the user is following in real time the ways uh, by real time visualization tool, the way the simulation occur and it can, the user can make choice at the time the simulation is running, which is a diff pretty different uh, use case. So we have to face with that, that uh, variety of data, variety of use cases, variety of uh, storage um, usage profiles. So for facing those challenges, we have to use uh, new paradigms. And uh, so the first one and the most important one from my point of view is the object stores. Object stores are very nice because of their, of their very, 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 very simple semantics. They rely on the so-called CRUD semantic. CRUD is an acronym which stands for Create, Read, Update, Delete. And those are the only four action you can do an object, no more, no less. And this very simple semantic makes the objects fully independent one from another. When you have your object store is capable to handle two objects, then you can handle billions of objects. That's the same problem. That's the same. But if you can handle the proof, uh, if you can do everything you need to for managing two objects, it's not, it's, you can scale very well. And uh, object store are usually used jointly with key value store, which are a lit, which are a bit similar. Uh, when you use object store, you get access to a content. When you use a key value store, you use a buffer to, 
to get access to another buffer. For example, you expose a, a key, which is, for example, uh, um, my first name on, uh, as a result of the key value, you get uh, my last name, for example. And uh, the object store are very interesting for, 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 uh, by, uh, for metadata management when you can associate a buffer to a key, uh, which is pretty, pretty interesting for handling metadata. Uh, we have to use uh, smart data placements. So, as we have, so we, we can address two of the problem with this uh, logic. If you consider the variety of uh, of uh, storage, then you will order them in a, in a storage stack like uh, NVRAM at the top. Well, we have no more NVRAM, but we considered using NVRAM at the beginning of the project. Then SSDs and HDD, and then tapes at the very bottom. It's interesting to place the right data at the right location. If you have a chain point restart file, for example, it's quite interesting to place it as close to the tape as possible for the probability that it will be read once written is very, very, very small. I used to call this kind of file one file, which stands for write once, read never. And uh, we have to deal as well for something which is very definitely connected to the next point, to data nodes. We need to have the um, data agent close to the place where the data are produced and consumed, play, close to the compute nodes, which, may, which uh, goes with the uh, introduction of the ephemeral services of the data and the data nodes. And we have to plus and allocate this data node wisely. And so we have a two dimensional data placement. First, plus the data at the right place in the storage hierarchy. Then, plus the data, at the, plus the, the agent accessing the data at the right location in the network, interconnecting the compute nodes and the storage nodes. The next point, so I, I, hold, I spoiled it a little, is ephemeral services and data nodes. So, basically, we can consider to their supercomputers which are direct, direct descendant from the old time SMP cluster. So they are kind of clusters of clusters of clusters. And in, within them, you have islets, uh, small components, which group uh, usually um, compute nodes with very high speed uh, network with very small latencies between the, the, the node, uh, the compute node in the same islet which make it possible to have MPI optimization, for example. We, uh, in IOC, we introduce the data nodes inside the supercomputer islets. So those data nodes are very, very close to the compute node uh, embedded in, uh, in, that, um, in that islet. And we try to, to, to use that data node by spawning ephemeral services on them. Ephemeral services are basically storage server dedicated to compute node running in that given islets and uh, used to perform every IO the compute job is needed. Ephemeral services do not exist forever. That's the reason why they are ephemeral. And they are starting with a compute job, or it could be a, a range of compute jobs. For example, if you chain several code together, then you will have an ephemeral services for the whole compute chain. Or if you do a parametric all uh, studies and how you then you know, run bunches of compute job, of small compute job with this, with a slightly different data data and see what are the effects of the parameters, but they are all associated together. And so we have you'll have these ephemeral services which are associated to compute jobs. They start with them and they die with them. Okay, so once we have these very, very basic uh, things, let's go with the uh, software stack. So this is the big picture of the software, st the software stack. So as uh, Martin said in the introduction, you ha we have to deal with the taxonomy of the file. So are they used frequently? Are they almost archived? So we have this idea of the file temperatures, which is from burning, where well, the file is frequently accessed, to frozen. And it's very similar to, uh, to statistical physics. Actually, when a molecule is, uh, is hot, it means that it has a, a nice speed on it. When a 
molecule is cold and it has a very, very slow speed and it doesn't move a lot. In, in this software stack, we will uh, see different components. So we'll have object store, so we'll have the motor and the uh, and the Phobos connected together by an HSM feature. And on top of the object store, we are introducing uh, ephemer different ephemeral services. So we have NFS and POSIX interface, we have S3 interface, we have the DAISY uh, API, which is a brand new API, which is uh, which is designed to facilitate the integration of uh, object store within a scientific world. Uh, all of this is managed by your resource manager on the top left hand side. And we have to deal with movement of data in between the various uh, so, uh, storage location between the HDDs and SSDs and tapes. And these are triggered and managed by the policy engine. Uh, everything is monitored. And we'll see later in this topic how monitoring information could be managed by AI-based uh, framework, which could analyze them in depth and uh, provide recommendation and optimizations. So this is uh, the the project from a from a more um, uh, software engineering point. So I will not enter it in detail. But basically, I have lots of slides to, to show you today. Uh, if I have about 100 of them, many, many of them. I will not uh, enter detail for everything, but uh, as the idea is that someone who gets this presentation, and I will publish it uh, for uh, as, a, as an IOC dissemination item. So everyone who gets a presentation could get uh, information without uh, having attended this meeting. So, uh, and basically, what you see on this slide, we have the data node and the compute node and the ephemeral services. I don't know. I don't know if you see my mouse when I move it. And um, everything is uh, is handling via the HSM feature and the workflow management and the monitoring telemetry. Okay, let's uh, come back to some uh, basic concepts, which are the roots of the software design. First one is a modular supercomputer architecture, which is a concept uh, which is supported by uh, Uli Supercomputing. And it's ba basically the idea is to group heterogeneous uh, compute model, each of them with some specification. So uh, for example, uh, neuromorphic models, some module dedicated to HAHI, some module dedicated to quantum computing. And uh, it's interesting to integrate IO in this. And we introduced this basically by having an IO module in the MSE. IO module, which is capable of providing the storage features, such as object store and tape management and this kind of stuff. And then uh, the IOC software providing all the software you need to spawn ephemeral services running in each highlight involved in the different uh, MS module in the MSA. Um, so this is a, the, the modules themselves may get optimization by embedding NV, NVMe disk and NVRAM. So we had NVRAM at the big, very beginning of the project. Uh, as you know, uh, the different vendor involved in the NVRAM technology choose to, uh, to get rid of it, to, to not to continue this effort. But it doesn't need that uh, the work we did for this NVRAM management is to be sent to the trash because uh, we have a, a way to use that by, for example, using very, very fast SSD disk connected to very fast buses, such as the CXL3, for example. And we lo are looking forward to, to use uh, the effort we did for NVRAM integrations to, to deal with that very fast disk with very fast buses. Um, Scheduling is very important stuff for us, as, as I explained to you. Uh, every compute node is associated with a data node and is associated with ephemeral services. And this is defined by a workflow. A workflow which stands, we'll have detail on that later, which explain how the, um, what kind of data the simulation code requires how the, the data server has to be started, what kind of resources are to be allocated, what kind of data set has to be exposed to the code on this kind of stuff. 
And um, this, uh, this introduced the concept of data sets. Data sets is a very important point. Actually, uh, when you uh, what, when you're running Luster, it makes it possible for every compute node in the, copy, in, uh, in the on the supercomputer to address consistently every node, every 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 data in uh, in the in the file system, which which is uh, 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 not useful for every situation. Imagine you have this kind of disaggregated architecture. And you have some biology scientists working on it. You have a climatology expert. You have a brain uh, science expert. That will not, uh, climatology is not done by using the data from the brain expert. And so you can split your data into data sets. As a, a simulation is starting, it says, I need this data set and I will update it. So I will have I will need to have it in a read-write mode, and I can say I need only those data in a read-only mode. For there are, for example, references. For example, you are working with energy physics. You have a set of you have a data set describing all the physics, the constant involved in the physics you're studying. So you describe the data set you require. For example, I need this result from this experience I did on November the fifth. For example. And I will I will run my simulation call on it to get to, to extract information. And uh, you, so you describe the data set you need, and you uh, give that intention to the workflow manager, who will use that to move the data to uh, the place close to the data nodes, and uh, start the ephemeral services. So. Uh, this introduced different layer in the software stack. We have the ephemeral services which are close to the compute node. And we have the long-term storage, which can be a little more distant to uh, the, the compute node. This make, so you can consider the ephemeral services as kind of proxy. And actually, they are not only proxies. From my point of view, they, they do this, this, this job as a proxy, and they have uh, dedicated resources, such as uh, NVMe devices, for example, to operate as, uh, as caches. But they are as well uh, bridges to uh, another uh, semantic. When you address the data from the compute node, you may, for example, want to have a POSIX interface, so address the, the data as files and being capable of uh, looking up in directories, creating new file, touching new file, uh, open, opening them with the open call in the libc, and so on, so on. Use them as everyday file system. You may want to address them using an S3 interface. We have some different uh, software exist which are using the S3 uh, interface for data management, or you may be using a middleware, which could be uh, accelerated by having a dedicated middleware agent uh, spawning close to the data node. So. FML services are both uh, proxies and uh, bridges which convert the semantics of the interface you have chosen to the, to the underlying semantics, which could be, uh, which is generally an object store semantics, so the semantic of the motor and the semantic of the phobos. Uh, in the meantime, um, the, this conversion will uh, be done in between the ephemeral services and the long-term long -term storage. So in IOC, we developed different components. The, long, the software to manage a long-term storage and the software to manage ephemeral uh, services. And this is basically what I just said. So, OK. <laughs> uh, so HSM. H, uh, so I guess you're familiar with uh, with HSM. So basically, just a quick update if you are not. So HSM stands for Hierarchical Storage Management. It's make it possible to um, to stack different uh, resources such as uh, tapes and HDDs and SSDs. And the idea there is to move the data as transparently as possible 
in between the different tiers so that the user could uh, benefit from it. And uh, the, the idea is to take the advantages from every available technologies. Tapes will usually come with very large volumes. When uh, SSD will have smaller volume, but uh, very, very more uh, efficient uh, bandwidths. And so we'll try to place the data at the location where we can benefit from every uh, feature from, uh, from, uh, from the component. And this means uh, placing the data smartly. And this is when we uh, will have the, an, a need for uh, a smart play, uh, placement agent that will be exposed later. Uh, HSM is quite a critical uh, point. And uh, in order to handle it properly, there, uh, the IOC uh, software de uh, uh, team developed a dedicated API to handle it, the STI API that will be exposed later. Data set and namespaces. Data sets are basically uh, a set of data, a set of files which have a good reason to stay together. For example, you, you, you took a vacation in the French Riviera and you took lots of pictures. Those pictures have, a, have something in common. There are the pictures tech that you do, that you have made during your vacation. So you can define a data set, which is containing all the data of your vacation in summer 2023. This is a data set. Then, you you when you want to expose the data sets to an end user, you have to choose an interface. For example, you have stored your picture in the cloud and you will address them using the S3 protocol. Then you will require an S3 namespace to address this data set. If you want to show those, those pictures on your personal computers, then you'll probably be more comfortable with a file-like uh, organization with tree and with uh, directories and, and file, uh, basically a, a tree-based organization which is uh, uh, compliant to the POSIX interface, and then you will have a, a POSIX namespace. So we'll have these two different concepts, a data set, which are set of data, and namespaces, which are interfaces used to expose uh, the data to the end user. And a data set may be exposed to different protocol using different namespaces. And this is basically a, a, a picture, an example of, of this kind of thing. So this is, a, this is basically one, one of those slides which is designed to, to make uh, this presentation a standalone stuff. So basically, those are the same stuff I, I have already exposed. So uh, when uh, talking about uh, the integration of uh, the namespaces, so namespaces, if you, once you have a data set, so data set, so, yeah, I wasn't clear. So data set resides basically on the right hand side of this picture. So it resides on the Fobo storage and the motor storage, basically on the object store. Once you have uh once you once you allocate to data nodes, this means that you have chosen a kind of uh, of namespace to be used to expose your data set. For example, you will use an NFS server, an ephemeral NFS server, or you may use a DAISY gateway because you want to address the data using the DAISY API. And so you'll be spawning uh, on the data node and ephemeral services implemented all the bridges that you need to, to use the namespace for accessing that data set. Uh, the kind of usage you want to do uh, on the data set is quite important. Uh, for, because it will uh, have consequences on the scheduling themselves. If you have two jobs who are accessing the same data sets in a read-write way, then you are coming to a reader-writer problem. You cannot have two, two, two actors handling the same resources in a read-write mode. So when you allocate an ephemeral services, you, you'll make sure that uh, you have no, uh, no conflict, that you will not uh, expose in read-write mode uh, twice the same data set. If you have a data set exposed in a read-only mode, then 
it will make it possible to expose it in read-only to many, many actors, but prevent, but will prevent any other actor to access it in a read-write mode. And at the end, on the left-hand side, you have those clients, which are the actual compute node, that will use uh, the available uh, interfaces, the available protocol, to access the data namespace managed by the, uh, the, the ephemeral services running on the data node, act, bringing, uh, making them uh, gateways, bridges, to the long-term object store, which its own interface, which is own logic. It's time for speaking about workflows. So basically we have, uh, so it's a, it's a little, it's, it's a, it's a, there are some redundancies there. So we have uh, this MSA architecture with different module and we have the storage module. So, and we want to, uh, as, as, I, as I told you, we want to have uh, access to, uh, that, to some data sets involved in my simulation. And for doing that, you, we have to start uh, uh, ephemeral services uh, running on data nodes, which means that we have to do several things. For describing the kind of data we need, and for example, you want to, uh, to do a fancy animation of your uh, vacation, the pictures you took from the from your vacations, and you will need to acquire this uh, this uh, data set which contains your pictures, and you will have to. Uh, but at the same time, you will res the result will be, for example, I don't know, an MP4 uh, uh, movie, and then you will have to allocate uh, some uh, data set, new data set, to contain uh, the movie you've done. So when you start a simulation, you have to say, I need this data as input, and I may potentially modify them or not. And you will say, I need this data as a result. And um, for each of the resources you want to access, you have to say, I want this kind of performances. For example, I will do a Navy metadata preacher on that data set, or, and so I need it to be, uh, to be installed on very high performance devices. Or you will say, okay, I will only write a large file and it will not be very, very, very high pressure I use. So you can give me uh, an HDD and then I will write my data smoothly on it. So when you start the computation, you describe very precisely what you want to do with what kind of resources in terms of data sets. Then this information is given to a workflow manager, which is basically uh, something working with the resource manager that will, hello, that will find the right data node with the right resources that correspond to your needs, and then spawn uh, 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 a ephemeral services. And this workflow will do all of the required uh, black magic so that the client could access the data. If you're accessing it in an S3 mode, then it's very simple. If you're accessing it, for example, using NFS, then you, you need to make sure that the NFS ephemeral services is mounted on the client in the right way. Um, so, yeah. Uh, this, uh, so this, this is kind of... Uh, of example, yeah, it, it would be probably easier to depict directly the kind of interface we have. So this uh, this kind of of uh, of use of the you need to describe the, the 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 way you want to access the data, and this is done by writing kind of a manifest to uh, to to help. To, to depict the kind of uh, of uh, use you will do for uh, of the of the resources, and the IUC software this define uh, uh, a set, uh, an API on a command line to 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 help in that. So you define a workflow as a YAML file, and then you you just start a session, and you can the workflow is defining different steps. And then you run the different uh, session and different state in the workflow. You can ask for study, you can list all of them, and you can, um, so 
yeah, yeah, many action you can do to operate uh, this uh, this workflow, which is basically kind of equivalent of a job. It's a, it's a large, it's a, it's something embedded a job. It's a declaration of a, a job to be run on the data nodes to spawn the right ephemeral services. And uh, so this, those are very low level uh, command. And uh, this is the beginning of this kind of concept. I guess that in the future of uh, IOC and uh, for other project, taking uh, benefits from the outcomes of the IOC, it probably should be arrived in the more higher level interfaces. So uh, the very important key is the workflow description file which is a YAML file, which describe every uh, every resources you need and every steps you need to configure the, the, the ephemeral services. For example, you have this one, which is called My Workflow, and it's based on an, ephem an NFS ephemeral services whose name is ephemeral underbar service underbar one. So it, uh, it's exposed the concept, the content of a data set, which is clear, clearly identified. Here it's a, it's a data set that my namespace. And uh, it's uh, said that to be mounted as a slash MNT slash user slash my, my workflow. And then we describe uh, several steps to be run. So we have that first step which is uh, to be to be used on GPU model. So basically the workflow manager will issue the SRUN command to start it, uh, to, the, uh, to send it to Slurm. And um, um, this is, this will basically will be done, oh, sorry, will be done by issuing the different uh, IOC-WF commands. Basically, this command is uh, set up to drive the behavior of the simulation involving both the data uh, nodes and the compute nodes, which means I, by starting the workflow and running the different steps, you will, you will not require to use Slurm anymore. It will uh, wrap the access to Slurm. Then it, it will start the uh, data node services. It will start and it will do the different uh, run of your different steps, which will be defined in the workflow management. And uh, you see there is this S run my step A. So we, you will not require to do uh, to do the S run yourself. You will just require to do the the run uh, run session step to uh, to to do that uh, that 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 job. And so this is a, this is a, an, an example of the status uh, verb in this comment, which helps uh, giving uh, you information about what are the Slurm uh, operations, the Slurm jobs that were involved, but what is the current status of your of your of your job. And um, and so you, as you see, you can uh, set up different uh, steps. So you have one first step on a GPO module. Step A and step B in CPU and GPU module, and at the hand the the, um, the step on, uh, on 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 next the step on on the ephemeral services. Uh, if required, uh, you may need to move data to the to the data nodes to populate the data node. And this is done basically by a feature called data mover. So data mover will make sure that if required, you will get all uh, your information moved to uh, the data nodes. And it is a special kind of services and a special kind of, uh, of state. And this basically define uh, how this is to be set up. Not all of the, uh, of the feature will require that time over. And it's uh, definitely done to make sure that you have, uh, if, you're, if you're using NVMe, for example, with a smart bus buffer, then you will have to make sure you have your, your data in the fastest storage installed in the uh, closest location to your uh, compute node on the fastest device, so basically the NVMe device. 
insist some things that could be that are that we introduce in IOC. So I'll be a little a bit fast on it. Uh, if not, I will exceed my time. Uh, so uh, ins are basically there to give additional metadata attached to the various uh, uh, data sets. And uh, it will help in uh, um, in uh, it will help the workflow manager and the scheduler to uh, to manage the the, the things uh, wisely. For example, you can say I will not change this data set, or this data set is expected to live for one month, or or um, it is a temporary data. And it's quite this kind of information is very important to schedule the information the right way, to schedule the access the right way. And I have shown you that we have a policy engine which has which has which has to place the data at the right location. It's very important to have this kind of in to help placing the data smartly. Okay, so this is uh, um this is an API to uh, to manage a namespace once we have the workflow. So once I have a data set, I can create a data set attached to it, and I can have uh, a namespace attached to it, sorry. And I have a, I can have different namespaces attached to my data sets. And one of the kind of data sets that we can have is, for example, NFS, for example, uh, DAISY or the S3. OK, so uh, next, I move to Phobos, which is an object store, uh, which is what is developed at EA. So the idea of Phobos is to be capable of uh, dealing with, uh, an ob with, with tapes. And uh, we noticed that there were very few object stores dedicated to tapes, and we chose to develop one. Actually, so it's the very it's definitely designed to uh, to handle to to handle a large amounts of data, hundred and thousand of petabytes up to the exabytes perspectives. So uh, it's not it's a uh, it's not uh, relying on on POSIX at all. Uh, so Phobos has definitely uh, an object store uh, interface, which is uh, object store is widely adopted by uh, by cloud. And um, it's, uh, I told you it was, so we have this crude in interface, this crude semantic, which is quite interesting. And uh, with, on which scale very well on the, Phobos is definitely relying on this crude semantic. As well, uh, uh, Phobos both use tapes and disk and uh, because we cannot, uh, definitely cannot handle uh, that large amount of data that will be what will, will be to be managed in a modern HPC system without tapes. And um, um, Phobos is um, performing this kind of scalability by explicitly managing tapes, but it's capable of managing disk as well. It's managed both of the post technology. So. As we, uh, Phobos is uh, is uh, an open source software, and it remove uh, vendor locking. You you have not to if you if you, you can use some proprietary applications, some proprietary uh, system, but sometimes when you want to move from a situation solution to another, uh, it's quite difficult. And most of, sometimes the, the solution itself do not depends on a well defined standard. And uh, you lack uh, when you want to move from another to, to, to another system, then you are uh, it's very difficult and the migration path is not easy. And uh, for both traits remove this vendor locking. And at the same time, the, the, the licenses for uh, HSM features, so for example, the HPSS license, is, is they are very complex and very from a jury, from a loyal point of view and very expensive. So uh, what we wanted to do with IOC was providing uh, uh, an open source uh, solution to, 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 to handle that matter. So uh, Phobos stands for Parallel Heterogeneous Object Store. So it's basically, it's basically uh, a design both for providing uh, on the fly uh, storage provisioning on object store for, uh, for tapes. And it's uh, managed, uh, it tries to implement uh, higher optimization for each technology. Uh, 
uh, from uh, tapes to to to, to, to discs. So within these uh, the, the guidelines of the of the Phobos was first a scalability and fault tolerance stuff. We used open standards such as the LTFS, which is uh, an ISO an ISO definition right now. It's not uh, it's not an IBM IBM does pro does a product on it, but it's rely on a completely open standard. We use common interface, so crude API with a REST uh, with a REST protocol. It's simple to interface with a very intuitive uh, CLI, and it's uh, it's not that complicated to deploy. And it's uh, it's and it's the deployment is based on very standard uh, tool from the Linux distribution. So this is the roadmap we had. So the idea there is that the product is still involving. And uh, one of the latest and more interesting point is that uh, we could successfully introduce parallelism in it. And Phobos is not uh, is not only a research product, it's something we use internally at the, uh, in one of our compute centers. So the CCMD, Supercomputer Center, is at CEA, is running using the Phobos software. Uh, Phobos components, so we they rely on NOS, NOSQL database. So, uh, they rely on I/O adapters, so POSIX, LTFS, Redis, which are gateways to uh, to the storage. And, uh, and at the top, you'll have this object store layer, which itself is providing various uh, various interfaces by uh, by Swift, by uh, Phobos, and via NFS. And actually, the, the interface via NFS is part of the IOC, is partly part of the IOC development. Uh, when uh, accessing the resources, it's interesting to schedule them and to optimize the stream, in particular when accessing tapes. Uh, if you notice that you will do a set of requests that are all accessing the same, the same resources, the same tapes, that it's uh, quite interesting to, to make sure that you do the request in the right order so that you do, are not impacted by the movement the, mo the movement of the of the tape itself that could be quite uh, inefficient in some ways. And uh, so this is the software roadmap, and um, we are currently online with that roadmap. We had no delay, and uh, we we could uh, in, parallel, in particular the uh, parallel uh, staff are, are are there. And the next, uh, the next uh, feature will consider disaster recovery of the uh, of the system, uh, management of an integration of media from other system to help uh, migration pass, uh, new layouts. The layouts are the ways uh, how you are managed in a in a in a in a Phobos and uh, for, uh, one of the layouts, uh, the current layout involves uh, parallel uh, write basically several tapes using as. Uh, as array, so you can have this, a similar feature to the red feature uh, implemented on tapes. And another uh, a forthcoming uh, feature will be the erasure coding feature to make sure that uh, we could uh, check integrity on the fly on uh, new backends and new frontends. And um, and so it's uh, so it's used at the CCMD and it's used for years to since the uh, year 2016. To, con to, con to preserve the data from the France Genomic Project at the TGCC facility. So it's not something new, and it's uh, something that, that can be used fully in production. And uh, um, uh, Phobos is developed uh, by a, a community which involves the DDN vendor, which involves the iCheck uh, 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 Research Center in Ireland. And we have the collaboration with Industrial, with Atos, CCMWF, and on, the, on the other partner in the IOC project, which is not surprising, actually. So Phobos itself uh, has a very simple configuration file, which is uh, compliant to the ENI, ENI syntax, and the ENI uh, syntax is uh, addressed by uh, a library provided with, uh, with every uh, Linux uh, distribution. So you just have to install libini-config, and you get, uh, you get this. And um, it's uh, it's under every parameter for IO scheduling, for accessing to the database, for accessing to the robot, and uh, everything actually. You everything you need to know about Phobos, but we're afraid to ask. You'll find the entity Etsy Phobos.com file. 
Phobos is managed by some demons. So that we have the Phobos demons, which are required for uh, for the client system to uh, to operate. So and it's a for a, a demon which you start using the syscatl or command usually. And you can so this is those are I'll be quite quick on that. So you can add a drive if you want to manage disk and to tape, sorry. And you can uh, add a tapes. So is, is this one you had a tapes? Oh, sorry. Uh, telling, telling it's an LTO6 tapes and you add it and you format it so that you can ad address it in the in the uh, in the in the uh, Phobos uh, software. And other resources such as uh, disk on Rados pool are uh, following the same kind of logic. So everything is, is quite uh, homogeneous. So those are administrative feature and these lock and unlock feature in drive are very important for managing drives that maybe become online, offline. So if a drive is faulty, then you want to, to do, do not want the software to use it anymore. And you will lock it on one, it's uh, it's uh, repaired, then you unlock it and everything goes fine again. And the same may occur for, for tapes as well. You can have faulty tapes that you need to repair and you can lock and unlock tapes. Um, yeah, okay, so you can get uh, uh, um, information. So for example, statuses of your drive, so administrative uh, information. You can, this is the way you can uh, put a file to Phobos. So this is, then you put a pass to, sorry, a slash pass. Every time I, I click with my mouse in, the, in this, um, in this PDF viewer, then it moves to the to the next page. Sorry for that. So in this example, you put an, a, a, a file to an object ID, and you and um, you you can attach arbitrary metadata on them, and uh, you can uh, get uh, the metadata only from these objects without uh, accessing the whole object because the that metadata and the data are very well separated, and you can list. This, you can use this metadata just by providing filter on the, uh, you can browse the data for it, just by providing filter on the metadata. So which is uh, provided by this example when you're, when you're looking forward for, uh, met, for, for objects belonging to a, a well-known user with a, a known pattern, a name, name pattern. And you'll get the the file back uh, in the using the get uh, the get feature, which is very so. We we have something very similar to 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 the S3 logic, which is not surprising, because both of them implement this crude interface, and uh, you can uh, do uh, parallel uh, parallel ac parallel put uh, on writing uh, multiple objects at once by the input command. Uh, so everything is managed by a Phobos daemon, which uh, does uh, every every operation you need. So I don't have time to to go to go deeper in that. So let's uh, let's go to the next. We have a client server uh, integration, and uh, which uh, make it possible to have a schedule, to schedule I/O and to use uh, Phobos daemon in parallel. And parallel, which is uh, uh, something that came in the last version of Phobos and which is fully available right now, is uh, make it possible to have several Phobos demons uh, to operate with uh, different uh, different clients. And it's pretty useful, for example, if you want to have a large large number of S3 uh, S3 clients, which uh, in this way. It's possible to have several Phobos daemon accessing the same uh, consistently, the same resources uh, using uh, S3 servers implemented off top of the of the Phobos daemon. And this uh, distribu distributing feature is quite critical in the uh, exascale perspective. We, we definitely need to have paral uh, AV parallelism in exascale. And this is a closer view on the way the uh, coordination features so this kind of distribution of, to stay coherent this kind of, of distribution that i just show need to be coordinated and this is done by a dedicated component called the phobos coordinator which makes it possible to use different uh, copy tool at the same time okay so 
I, I spoke, I already spoke about that. So we have an S3 service. We have a Luster backend to Phobos, which is basically implemented as a copy tool. So I don't know if you're very familiar with the Luster HSM feature. So basically, Luster HSM make it possible to, to have within the Luster namespace what I called Olo inodes, which are inodes which are not containing actual data, but a reference to a storage system, for example, the HPSS system or any HSM you want. On the first time you address the uh, you 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 want to open uh, to open the file an, an allo, if you want to open an allo, an allo high node which contains some data in the namespace in the in the HSM namespace, then there will be an auto, uh, an invocation automatically of a copy tool that will retrieve the information from the HSM and populate the allo high node which will then contain the real uh, content of the file. And this is done pretty pretty transparently for the end user, and it requires the existence of a, of a copy tool. And we within the um, within the, uh, the, the the Phobos we have this uh, a copy tool feature, so make, which make it possible to to make a Luster operate with Phobos, and it's in production at the CCMT facility. You could uh, add uh, so tags is. Uh, is very similar to git tags actually on a help in uh, in uh, managing the data you can set up permission to make sure that uh, no every users can access uh, data that they are not allowed to access uh, you can define uh, families which are a way to give common parameters to storage that uh, will be used for uh, saving your data making sure that data of the same nature will be used on met on storage of the same nature uh, so 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 yes yeah, so family can be can manage can be managed within the configuration file and um yeah some so on can be on this aliases could be used as well for managing metadata Versioning. Versioning is quite an interesting feature. So you can have several, when you, you can overwrite a, a file. But once you have overwrite, overwritten a file, you still can access the older version because you, you have, and you can list the former version of the of the of the object by yeah. using the by listing them with the double dash deprecated uh, keyword. And if once you have identified an older version, then you can you can choose to retrieve the data, the older version, just by specifying the version. So the Phobos get uh, invocation will turn into the Phobos get double dash version something, and uh, then you will get the version you want. And you you can uh, delete object, and because we are uh, we are dealing with uh, versioning, then we can undelete object. And uh, it's um, it's uh, very it's uh, those two uh, feature uh, undulation and versioning are very acquainted was one with another. So location helps in knowing where the, when your data is uh, is uh, so it's very important this location to for the IOC as I told you it's important to to smartly place the data within the storage hierarchy, within the, the, the different uh, topology of the network, the different uh, node in the topology of the network. And this, uh, so you may have several, several Phobos daemon, and it's very important to know where, where, where the, the, the things are located. Uh, okay, so I'll be talking about the HSM feature, which, uh, and then I'll be will we'll be stopping for for a few minutes for a coffee break. Okay, so uh, this is a big uh, big picture of the of the HSM features. So basically, the idea there is that we definitely need a dedicated API for uh, for dealing with HSM. And uh, so at the time we we were, we were using um, we we're starting the project we use the motor uh, motor uh, uh, object store from Seagate and the Phobos object store from uh, from um, Seagate uh, during the project Seagate decided to get rid of motor 
but uh, we so it's, it's it has a great impact on the IOC system and the IOC development itself. But actually, we 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 will be able to to replace Cortex with other solution, motor Cortex with other solution, probably based on some uh, safe features. So uh, uh, every time you hear me speaking about the motor feature uh, within the uh, the this presentation, you can uh, you can imagine that I am. Speaking about Ceph, <laughs> and everything will be will be will be feasible with Ceph at the same time. And so uh, the the development of the STR component has been done for uh, providing uh, an abstraction of the HSM and manage it in a in a very 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 uh, uh, global way, making it possible to handle the different uh, storage uh, storage uh, tiers and making it possible to implement the various namespace. And the idea there is to have this. Uh, this this um, common API to deal everything. So the STR component it has been developed by the iCheck uh, people. Uh, so you can see their their address to their to their Git. So it's based with uh, it's it's uh, based on CMake for compilation. It's based on standard components such as curl, libs3, and uh, YAML uh, YAML JSON. And uh, it has uh, been uh, div di di uh, propagated using the open source MIT license. So STR components have all different services, uh, so which are depicted on on this picture. So you have the API, which makes it possible to access the, the, the to implement to access the services, which are themselves using Object Store and uh, and the uh, basically storage services. And so the, this is, I will not enter in detail in that, uh, in that, uh, on that slide. It's, it's here mostly to, to give some information about the, the, the whole infrastructure, the whole architecture. So it's, it may seem a little complicated, but it's not, it's not at all actually. We have that very, 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 very common stuff that we have seen many other places in the presentation. Client wants to do something in a distributed way. So we have different nodes and different worker. And in, made, in order to make sure that everything is consistent, that you need someone to control. And you have this controller node that makes sure that all the accesses are consistent. And in order to work properly, you have you know this uh, small uh, boxes on top of the controller node, which are the database handling all of the metadata required to make sure that uh, the, the things are the, to, 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 to handle the consistency of the worker working together. Uh, application to, to the STR, so it can be used to, uh, with, uh, with Luster. It can be used to with a local, uh, local HSM, and it has a specific uh, C and C++ API. So we have uh, so various uh, various application. I, I will be, be fast on this one. And uh, if you have questions about the STR, uh, you can contact the the people from iCheck. And I, I have seen uh, I have noticed that James is uh, is online. I don't know if he's still there, but he is one uh, one good point. I, I see that Bucket as well was uh, was. Uh, was in the attendees list of this call, so you don't hesitate to contact. The, I, I, I check people on um, the main idea on this uh, STR stuff is that you can uh, you have this common API, you have this common infrastructure, you have which can help managing HSM feature in a very 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 uh, standardized way. Well, it's now speak about the <clears throat> data access storage interface, which is a contribution from the ECMWF um, about uh, about uh, it, within the work package five on the on the IUC project. So um, the outline. So we'll be exposing the concept of the design of the IUC, the API, and some example on some uh, inter way uh, it's in the, it's integrated within the ephemeral workflow. And with uh, how it could interoperate with with POSIX. So uh, Daisy is uh, 
fundamentally uh, a scientific interface and it's uh, supposed to provide a very simple interface which uh, is uh, easily um, manageable by some scientists and it's completely abstract the um, the storage point of view and the uh, the informatical concept so what what for example what a researcher would like to do is we have this example on the right, right hand side where he, he is um, someone has studied the uh, covid so and uh, he has a date for an experiment a number for an experiment and some variable attached to it and uh then it can give all of this addressing information which are uh, the component of the address to to his data and it's not uh, this semantic is uh, is not uh, about building a uid or building a pass to to access the data it's really about uh, providing a researcher with a way of uh, being detached of the underlying storage technology which helps in having flexibility in uh, storage backends without impacting the users as long as they, they keep using the daisy and uh, making it possible for uh, the storage backend to get optimized so within the ioc project we have different use cases which involve the ioc so one is uh, hosted at SciTech, which is very close to uh, 84i about uh, image, raw imagery on the uh, image processing we have the lqcd software at on a tsmp software at ulish ramses simulation card at cea ecmwf which is uh, the place where uh daisy uh, daisy is rise is is created which using for uh it's uh with a forecasting workflow and the uh, cyan lab uh, middleware uh is that from uh, from ulish is as well using the daisy so the um, daisy core the daisy is uh, architecture of, around the core which provides an index abstraction on a storage abstraction and uh, an api which is used by the different uh, different client of the daisy so it could be used by uh, um, middleware so we have Cyanlib, MPIAU, and, and H, uh, hdf5 here it can be used directly by some use cases we have built a POSIX NFS interface about DAISY, which makes it possible to show us as a, as a, as a POSIX tree the different uh, the information stored in the DAISY. And uh, as a component of the IOC system, uh, DAISY is interoperable with, uh, with the IOC HSM API, with the STI API. So the layered uh, component of the DAISY basically allows to abstract uh, both, um, completely abstract, abstract the, the different underlying concepts. So you remember at the very beginning, I told you that we were using object and we were using KVS at the same time. And we find the same kind of idea there. We have uh, a need to uh, for to to indexing the information, which is a mere metadata matter, and we have to give access to the content to the stored information, which is a, a complete data storage uh, abstraction problem. And within Daisy, we have uh, everything. Uh, designed for providing the abstraction on the indexation and the abstraction on the storage. And everything is, uh, is handled by, by the DAISY core. So DAISY is definitely not uh, uh, in, in its spirit a client server stuff. It's a wrapper to lower level data store, to lower level uh, induction, induction uh, devices, metadata management devices. And uh, it has, uh, for example, it may rely at, uh, on some uh, other, uh, as a backend, for example, it can rely on the motor, it can rely on the Phobos, it can rely on the necessary data store. And uh, we, at, at the time, uh, th there was an actual uh, development did, done by, for uh, integrating the motor cortex as, uh, as, uh, as uh, storage is uh, in, uh, in the DAISY. 
and it uh, it's, will be feasible to replace the motor by something else. So this is a picture that I, I show you. So we, we remember uh, the Daisy can be um, can be part of the ephemeral services. So we can uh, you can use it uh, within the IOC software stack. On uh, let's let's give you a few examples. So the Daisy uh, API. So Daisy has different. Um, a different API, one is C++, one another is Python. So we are, the, the important idea is the schema, the collection schema. So you have a, your a data which is uh, which is addressed by, by an address which has a, a well-known well template. For example, we have a model, which is a string. We have the date, which is a time time. A date time, then a number of a number representing an experiment, an epoch time, which is an integer, and a variable, which is a string. And every data has attached metadata, which help in finding it. And uh, those metadata are compliant with the collection schema. And it uh, you can make a query saying, okay, I want on this uh, on this schema, I want to access uh, experiment experiment number 42 and get the information on the epoch 123, 124, 125. This will be done by opening a session to the to the daisy where you will basically ad address a def defining the kind of server you want to use and defining the schema which uh, you'll be using for accessing the data. Then uh, you'll be performing uh, all of the requests you need. So we have put and get operation and um, list the result. Um, basically, it's basically, yeah, you can access both uh, the data on the indexation. So you have the list operation, which will give you uh, the kind of, uh, of information you can get from a, from a schema. And then, for example, uh, list all the available variable you get in experience one, two, three, for example. And, uh, you, you know that you have variable number, uh, you have, for example, uh, variable A, variable B, variable C. And then you can build up a query to, to get and put information based on this. So this is a, a more concrete, uh, concrete stuff. When you, when you have this query, which is uh, so it's still the Python interface. So you you first open the Daisy service, set up a query, uh, set up an IO policy, which uh, helps in defining the kind of uh, behavior you want. So you remember the temperature we had at the beginning. So we can use that to set up a policy defining the kind of, uh, of access we want to the data. And we can inform the storage system that the data is supposed to be hot or cold. And um, put your data with the related metadata, which is defined as, uh, as this Python uh, object. The diff so Remember, you remember the workflow description file that I showed you? Uh, so Daisy could be integrated with the Daisy this way. Uh, so which which on, um, so it's fully integrated with the workflow description file. And uh, we are working on uh, making uh, POSIX uh, integrity. Uh, which is still an uh, under a whip a whip uh, software a work in progress, which will expose uh, the information in, within the Daisy in a NFS uh, POSIX tree. For example, uh, if I am back to to this, we can have a mod, uh, for example, a tree which will contain uh, COVID slash the date time slash uh, 20, 21, 01, 12 slash the number of experience, 42 slash the epoch and slash the name of the variable. And it will be possible to build this namespace on the fly and uh, use it to expose uh, the information to uh, the end users who do not want to use the DAISY at all. So by providing this kind of uh, POSIX interface, it's fairly possible to, to expose the data to non 
DAISY aware uh, client to client who have not installed the DAISY software on DAISY client. Um, it's time to talk about instrumentation and monitoring. So I'm a little earlier on time, which means that we'll have the opportunity to have a question, I guess, in uh, in a few minutes. So which is cool. So uh, the object, the we have many components within the, the IOC software stack. And it's uh, interesting to know how each component is behaving and how each component could be optimized. And this means that we need to have probs and we need to have uh, metrics which, which make sure that every, uh, every component is first behaving correctly. So there is a, a question about health checking and uh, make sure that we are not uh, using the resources in a bad way that we are not producing congestion that we are not uh, that we are not using very frequently a set of the data nodes which are very very overcrowded while at the same time other resources are not used at all and uh, do all of the required uh, things we need to do for Classing uh, information at the right, at the right, uh, so both placing the IO services at the right location, places the data at the right position within the um, the the, network, the storage stack. So this first come with uh, IO instrumentation. So the, those slides are coming from the ATOS uh, uh, company. So. Um, data nodes will be completely uh, integrate uh, will completely integrate several uh, props, and those props will uh, be used to 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 feed a MongoDB uh, database, which will gather every information from the get from uh, from the data node and from the compute node. So we'll, the idea there is we have this large non-structured database, which uh, handles every information from the data node and from their client, from the compute node. Uh, these informations uh, are to be displayed. So the Seattle's team worked on defining the very very fancy web based uh, UI, which helps in providing information about um, the behavior of the job, the way the, the workflow are, are working, the way the, the, the jobs themselves are working, the different uh, usage of the resources, the bandwidth, the storage, uh, storage bandwidth, the IO bandwidth, uh, the occupation of the space on the devices, and so on. Uh, this is uh, so they, they, they use the key clock authentication, and uh, it's fully integrated with Slurm. They can get the prob from the Slurm device to feed the MongoDB database and get useful information about the resource manager, such as uh, the way the job has, has to wait, the time where the uh, the job the job spent and the, on the on the different node um, the kind of uh, of queue the the job were placed into and, and so on recommendation system is something that comes directly from that collection of uh, of data from that very comprehensive collection of data uh, it's um, it's we can basically we, we can we we used uh, in the, in this perspective uh, a high framework basically in machine learning and deep learning in order to identify patterns to identify hidden behaviors within these data sets. It helps in identifying uh, IOs that are uh, IO objects that are behaving the same way. 
are uh, identifying um, family of objects that are to be used in a similar way. And uh, by identifying that stuff, it's possible to give the information to the system so that it performs optimization. I, I told you uh, all, several times about places where you can pro you could provide ints to uh, to the system. You can provide ints to the Phobos. You can provide uh, uh, policies in Daisy to say how hot your data are. You can use the uh, um, STI API to give ints about the, 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 the object. But sometimes uh, the user is not playing the game and is not um, providing uh, the ints on his uh, and we because we we, we we really need that information the the recommendation system could do an analyze of an analysis of this um, of this large um, mongodb database and provide some uh, some hints to be used by the system to help categor categorizing all of the of the information we have if I may, I have a probably a bit unrelated question, but uh, it is uh, focused on a new uh, new storage technologies which are coming. I, I know that we see in the project the uh, decline of the um, NVIDIA technology propagated by Intel and uh, Jim Micron. And uh, supposed uh, uh, the best let's say that the next uh, technology in the pipeline is the cxl but i just saw only let's say some prototypes and so on but are you aware of any let's say technologies which will be post cxl at the moment not for not for the moment actually cxl is very on the edge of this kind of uh, of, of feature and um I have the feel it, it was not completely designed for uh, for for storage, but was the disappearance of uh, of Nvidia of NVRAM, sorry, for example, sorry, sorry, or of NVRAM. Uh, I guess there will be a, a, an important uh, usage of CXL in the future, and um, it's definitely not the last uh, fast burst technology that will be that will be involved. But it's it's a promises it's a promising one. So, well, for example, uh, do you think that it will also replace uh, ordinary interfaces such as PCI Express and so on? Maybe yes, but uh, for a system, it you will need systems that will require uh, this kind of fast uh, of fast interfaces on. If you, I guess, PCI Express will remain in some in many use cases. For you do not, uh, you do not need to invest in uh, in that kind of technology, because uh, PCI Express done, does the job perfectly. But for some stuff, when you have to address very fast SSD drive, when you work with similar capabilities and feature as what you have in a, in a, in, a, in VRAM, then you will need to have that kind of buses that does does the job, and you will need the Excel. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, uh, Philip. Uh, maybe an obvious question, but um, you know, uh, we are at the stage of deployment our uh, tools uh, that we developed for the last one year and uh, integrating it with the uh, other tools uh, developed in the WP4. And uh, so, is there a plan, maybe, uh, or what is the timeline, uh, maybe? Um, after the project, uh, when uh, these uh, will be the tools, all the tools developed for this project be available for public use or for, you know, um, publicly available to other people um, to de uh, deploy in other HPC yeah. systems. So we have the, the GitHub uh, organization, so IOC namespace which is available on GitHub and uh, which gather all the contribution from the various software developer involved in the IUC. Um, basically, the, the big challenge for the, the last months of the project as uh, most of the work package has delivered all of the promised uh, software will be to make sure everything is integrated together. So basically building uh, uh, um, uh, an RPM 
repository because we are definitely acquainted with Red Hat based uh, operating systems. So building that, uh, that repository of RPM, making sure that uh, no software dependencies conflict and making sure that you can uh, do something like DNF installed IOC or you installed IOC so that you get all the in, all the software you want uh, in, a, in, a, in a very reduced uh, set of comments without conflicts. And that's uh, the conflicts and the dependencies, which could be some, quite complex in some ways with some, uh, some software, will definitely will be the, the trickiest things to deal with. And once we have this uh, RPM repository, which will be able to, to wrap it with, for example, Ansible configuration, so that a system developer wants to deploy a new system, just have to run the Ansible script so that uh, the, the software is installed on the system. And um, this so this work should uh, so the creation of the RPM repository is something we'll be doing in uh, in the we'll be starting in the forthcoming weeks. Lots of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. I guess that uh, we arrived uh, at the end of our training a little bit earlier than expected, but uh, nevertheless, it was a very interesting uh, session. Thank you very much, Philippe, for delivering the, the talks and presenting us uh, many interesting topics. Also, thank you, uh, all the participants uh, who connected us, uh, connected to the training. And uh, I would like you uh, to check also our uh, website uh, with all the other uh, events we are organizing in IT4I. Also, thank you very much for uh, Katarzyna Slaninova and Karina Peshatova, which is uh, with us here today for organizing uh, this uh, event. Also, please make sure you will uh, visit uh, our YouTube channel uh, where the recording of this training session will be presented. Also, the project website contains all the news and um, important updates of the project, uh, ioc-project.eu. And also, as a last point, I would like you to, I uh, would like uh, to invite you to um, uh, upcoming uh, trainings, uh, also organized uh, by it Fry. And the first one will be on the 21st of November, 2023, will be online session uh, driven by Partec company. And the title is Automated Workflows and Benchmarks with Tube in the IOC and Beyond. I think that uh, this session will be very interesting for everyone who uh, uh, ever done uh, some HPC scaling tests, HPC benchmarking, and so on. So definitely, I can recommend uh, you to join this session and uh, dedicated session to the DASI interface Philippe presented earlier will be held on 5th of uh, December, 2023, also online, and it will be driven by our colleagues from ECMWF. Thank you very much for participation. See you next time on some of the other trainings.